Welcome back. Let's see. Uh, I'm going to try and focus in on the little land from Compass Games, and it's one of uh, Adam Starkweather's titles in that uh, CSS system, the company scale system, I think is the correct definition of it. And that's really for Dan Palkeldy, so he knows what we're talking about. Hey, Dan. Uh, interesting particular, in interesting topic. Uh, the, the battle on the uh, Eastern Front is set in late 1942. And I've got some pictures here to my right that I'm going to be looking at and referring to and some notes here that I want to read to you. Uh, and then talk about the game in the context, uh, uh, in that context, and then go through my typical AAR kind of process or uh, ten top ten top ten items I, I tend to look at when I when I play a game. But I think it's important because this is a small, relatively unknown battle, uh, which I know very little about. We primarily played it because it's a two mapper, and we were just going to do the one map scenario and that would give us an opportunity to explore more of the system. So there's three of us playing, with one person playing the Germans and uh, two people picking up uh, one formation each from the, uh, from the Russians. But a little bit of context. So I guess we're late in 42, Stalingrad's happening and uh, the siege is going on and the Germans are retreating and collapsing. Uh, the Russians are extending their supply lines and uh, having great fun and knocking things out and taking, uh, kicking ass and taking names. However, they're becoming uh, attrited and worn down and a little tired and uh, their supply lines are a little overextended as well. So it's at that point that the, uh, the progress is really not going as well as everyone wants. And then this... Uh, you know, an army group A from the Germans had managed to sneak out of the Rostov Gap uh, before the Russians could close it. And so along the Black Sea coast, there was a combination of good defensive terrain and secure supplies for the Germans uh, and a general exhaustion of the advancing Russians, which is pretty much what I just said. Uh, let's see. Uh, so this Taman Peninsula is a particular part of, uh, piece of geography that was key for the Russians to secure, allegedly. And uh, they created a code name uh, operation called uh, Gory Morsky. That's going to scare you, right? Uh, Morsky was an, had a naval component in the offense uh, that was designed to capture this town, which is it's the name of the game called the Battle of uh, Novorossiya. I think would be the quickest way to mumble that. Primarily through the use of amphibious invasion behind the enemy line, and there was a parachute drop as well, I believe, which we didn't play that section of it. And then the other forces were uh, advancing up this uh, particular, uh, to connect up to this particular uh, peninsula, and they were a little, uh, a little run down and a little thin. So uh, the plan was over. Bold 47th Army was uh, uh, launched this overland attack. But the guys were tired and exhausted and all the rest of it. Uh, let's see. Amphibious forces were no better off. So I think that gives you a general context of what what the situation is. And then we get into the CSS system in this particular this particular battle. And some of you may know that I've kind of I've kind of struggled with the GTS and um, the GTS and CSS systems at the, this company scale and the rule books and the gameplay and the evasions and all that sort of stuff. And I had yet to work out, do I really like it? Do I love it? Do I hate it? And I think this, this particular title is moving me down a, a path to having an, an opinion on what I really think or what I think I might think at, at the very least. So, so <laughs> this is an odd choice for a battle. Uh, it's uh, we're dealing with uh, two very different types of force, uh, which is cool. But you really only get there's two there's two elements here. There's one formation that is called I wrote down its number, uh, the thirteen thirty ninth division or brigade. Set, not the division. Maybe that was one of the battalions. I need to find the name. Um, well, there were elements of the Third Army, uh, Third Corps, I'm sorry, on one side, which really didn't do anything the, the entire game uh, that we played. 
And then uh, there were these uh, other formations of which I think they were all actually regiments from the 1339th Division, maybe. And I um, apologize for not having the right. Uh, let me see if I've got the division names here. Uh, there was the 90th Special Special Landing Fourth Force. That is not it. I don't have the actual formation name. It might be on one of these other pictures here. Let me see if I can find it. 1331. So maybe that is a regimental name by the looks of it. I'm trying to find this one photograph. You'll see all these going on in the background, hopefully, when I'm doing this. Here we go. So elements of Third Rifle Corps, and I cut off the uh, cut off the name of that division there. I can't read it. That's disappointing. All right. Well, anyway, there's a there's a there's a Russian division there, and we'll uh, we'll take care of it. Oh, now I've got to go. Uh, let me pause for one second. Well, in a unique feature of the slideshow, uh, you can only go you can only go one way, apparently. Thanks, Microsoft Surface. Okay, I have no no idea where I was now that I've got this back. I couldn't find the name of the division. I'm all discombobulated. Maybe I'm going to delete that out of the video, or maybe we'll just post it. Who knows? So what I was going to try and tell you is that it was an unusual choice for a battle because we've got a couple of relatively exhausted divisions. And that forces you to uh, apply some ratings to some of the units and their capabilities that uh, I think perhaps detracted from the game and turns, uh, turns this particular battle in, on, on this one map pretty much into a, almost a World War I style uh, battle for the first seven, eight, nine, ten 10 turns, which is a little bit of a slugfest using the uh, CSS system which I think shines brightest when it's a maneuver-oriented battle. Um, that's my opinion. I'm not sure that I've played a game like that yet, but I think that's where this would shine. So before we go getting into, uh, getting into more about the actual battle and all the rest of it, hopefully it'll come out as we, as we chat, and this might end up being a long video, so I'm gonna apologize in advance. Uh, let's start with the, the decision space. You're, you're running battalions and managing divisions. So you're doing the tactical detail of battalions, moving companies of units around in battalion formations with supporting elements and divisional support. You know, you're going to allocate trucks if you want to move a gun that's been in place and all this sort of stuff. Great. Uh, the the command level stuff for division, for each division, and there's often multiple divisions on a set of maps, is run via a construct of uh, command points and dispatch points. And dispatch points are the ones that are gonna let you activate a formation once, activate the entire division one time, all the formations inside that division, uh, which you can do both. You can act actually activate things twice. And then you're also gonna get an opportunity using command points to give direct commands to units and let them do incremental things again or have a second activation after they've already activated. One of the nice things about the uh, CSS system compared to GTS is that many of the rules have been cleaned up, refined, simplified and streamlined and it, it makes learning the system and playing the system much, much easier and allows you to focus on the tactics of the situation versus fighting a rule book, which was generally speaking highly conversational in in its format and structure in the old GTS stuff from MMP. GTS is Grand Tactical System. So uh, the so that that usage of uh, command points and dispatch points is critical if when you're playing the game. If you don't have dispatch points, you can't move units or do anything with the units. So what do you do when you have a uh, tired or exhausted formation? Well, you don't give them as many dispatch points and so they can do a limited number of things a turn. However, you face this, the struggle here of making the scenario interesting to play uh, and, and, and creating the flavor of perhaps what happened at that battle. I've yet to find a report on this battle in, in detail, like a battle report. Uh, so I can't tell you historically exactly which formations did what. But based on what we're seeing here, I'm going to call them the brown units. 
the brown units in the, that el the elements of the third core uh, basically uh, get one divisional activation every other turn or can activate one or two regiments per turn. It's very difficult and in fact I don't believe the uh, chap who I was playing with Greg really got to do a whole lot. He was very gracious and hosted us at his house. Poor guy maybe moved uh, you know, forward one or two hexes in this assault, right? Whereas I was uh, activating, uh, almost always activating the division every turn or every other turn and activating all of the regiments every turn. And having command points, more, more to the point, having command points available to conduct secondary actions, which is how you get into, you barrage something, get into position, and then you do an assault or, or you're firing and you get, uh, you know, get your results. And you get multiple units firing at a specific hex, trying to wear it down with uh, disorganizations. And once you get hex, I think it's four. Once you get four organizations, you get one more, you're eliminated. Or you get two suppressions, you're eliminated. There are two ways you can, you can die in this game, other than being assaulted. So, so I had lots and lots of things to do. Took a little bit, uh, a couple of turns to get back into the groove of the, the very strict, I think, very strict tactical doctrine you have to apply, just like any system, right, with lock and load or ASL or uh, OCS or TCS, any of these other, you know, acronym games at the tactical sort of uh, uh, platoon down to uh, squad level. There are ways that you should play to optimize your ability to get a result that you want. And, and this game will punish you terribly if you don't follow the sort of approved doctrine uh, uh, we've all experienced that playing at the three of us who are playing it and so my comments are also not just my opinions and thoughts on this i'm, I'm also uh, grafting and, and drafting in a few uh, thoughts from other folks that were playing with me as well okay so that's the decision space it's interesting and that dispatch command point thing really makes a difference uh, if even just a few extra command points would have driven the game or accelerated the game and, and stopped it from feeling like a little bit of trench warfare. Because the first thing my formation, the red formation, was, is going to do, which hopefully you'll be seeing uh, behind me at some point, uh, is they're going to move, uh, move up and move adjacent to the enemy. Use command points in the next, uh, in, in the act in a, for second activation to dig a foxhole and hunk it down. And they're doing that so that they can stop the uh, the Germans from firing anybody else, uh, and also so that they can uh, use uh, be, use them for spotting and things like that. And you want to get closer. That hopefully you, you chip away at these guys, and then you may have an opportunity to assault them, or you may be able to chip away at them by firing multiple times at them and, and killing and killing the unit, breaking open a creating an opening two three four hexes wide, and then you can push through a, a, a battalion that was sitting in reserve and not in reserve, but waiting, uh, and shoot through the gap and see if you can't exploit and go from there, right? Uh, so your role is pretty deeply focused on where am I gonna put this company with this machine gun, this support weapon, or this AT gun, or this, where is this mortar unit gonna be so it can project some fire where I need it? How am I gonna do these things and achieve my objectives, which is you know capturing some VP locations somewhere in the way, way, way back. We, we got very, we didn't get very far. Uh, and we played a lot of turns. You have pretty much, uh, so, so that's, your, that's kind of your decision space is, is making those types of choices. And of course, there's this little bit of a meta game going on at the divisional level is, am I gonna burn through all these dispatch points and command points? And as I use, as I activate my division every turn or every other turn or every three turns or every four turns, I'm either accruing fatigue points or, or gaining fatigue, uh, lessening my fatigue by not using the division. So both the divisions start out rel with a relatively high uh, fatigue factor, and that's given that this is a game of uh, two hour turns, 500 meter hexes, come night, if you're highly fatigued, it's gonna take you a lot longer to recover than it would if you were at a lower fatigue state, obviously enough. And so there are benefits for later in the day having lulls or having lulls in the middle of the day and having that battle cadence very very realistic feeling I think you can't just fight with a unit for 24 hours and then not expect to have a consequence the next day right so so that all of that is very very cool 
So there's some decision making that goes into that, you know, with the with the Russians. Do I just burn up uh, a division and see what I can do with it? Or do I pace myself and then hope that one of this other division that couldn't do very much, maybe it can accumulate some dispatch points and command points over the course of the day so that in day two, it could then pick up uh, the offense and, and pick up where the, uh, where the red division uh, left off from because it chewed itself up beat up some German units and kind of, we kind of went, kind of go from there, right? And then let the brown guys take over and, and see what happens. So there's some decision level stuff being happening there. Next factor we usually look at is intelligence. I think you have pretty much an open book. You're able to see pretty much what's going on all over the board in terms of look at, at stacks and things like that. We're not supposed to be looking at each other's dispatch points and command points. We're playing a friendly game here, so we're not too, you know, you're not, looking over going, oh, well, they can't do anything this time. We're just focused on our game, right? So you're not supposed to be looking at how capable of reacting or acting uh, the, the Germans or the, the, the opposing player, the Russians are. And I just lost my screen. Here we go. All right. Um, let's see. Objective wise. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, they vary scenario to scenario. So it's all VP based and uh, location based typically and killing bits. Kill bits, you get VPs, which <clears throat> is, is what we tended to focus on in this game because we knew we probably weren't gonna get very close to a VP hex. I think I got within three hexes of one in this game, but uh, not much of a chance to actually capture that because it was a, a couple of stray companies and it really didn't have the backup or support, uh, artillery support needed to uh, you know, form up some sort of a assault to capture a hex. I think the moment you do that, all you do is bring the wrath of God down on you with uh, artillery anyway. So I tend to avoid the VP hexes for the time being. So you build up some force and you can capture it with uh, great strength later. Great OB granularity, if you know. I mean, I, I'm assuming this is awesome, right? Uh, we're down at the, you know, their X number AT rifles and AT guns and there are mortars of various types and everything has the Russian and, and the German uh, logos, um, you know, icons on them for the, uh, for the uh, weapon definitions. It uh, looks to be particularly granular to me. I can't vouch for it. I didn't do the, the unit research. Maybe Jack Rady can jump in and tell us that it's, it's thumbs up great, right? Uh, and this is probably a slightly longer conversation here, but let's see how we go with, uh, with the combat resolution, the kinetics of, of the game. Pretty tough. Typically what's gonna happen is you're, you're, you're well, there's a, you're looking for a means to suppress in some way or other the combat ability of the unit you wanna attack. So you wanna fix them, right, in place, suppress them, and then either you know either with a combination of flanking or just direct fire, kill, kill them outright if you can. You put a heavy barrage on someone, it's gonna subtract three from their firepower. It's not gonna let them shoot beyond their immediate zone of control. You put a medium barrage, it's gonna subtract two from their firepower. You put, um, and nor is it gonna let them move. Uh, a light barrage will put, a, will put one, uh, minus one on their firepower. So, very significant impact so that once you do move Jason, these guys can't fire very effectively at you, right? The cool thing about the combat, you know, there's uh, uh, armor piercing fire, um, high explosive fire, then small arms fire. And low number results mean you will hit. Like a zero will always hit, a nine will always miss. But the some of the best combat results are the benefit of having a very high attack number, so a five, six, seven, eight, or nine would be awesome because those combat results up at eight, right? Very deadly, you might get two, three, or four uh, DGs, or you might get a suppression, or a, you know, a route check with a penalty, but a zero will always get, always get you some result, and that might be a route check, or a suppression, or a pin, or, or, or something like that, right? So there's this dichotomy of, I wanna get a lot of combat firepower in one hex shooting at you, but I need a low number to guarantee that I'm gonna get a hit. <coughs> so often though, 
you'll only be able to get enough points, uh, combat factors, to put together a two, three, four, or five strength shot. And then we subtract defensive terrain, uh, other factors like that, and that will uh, reduce that chance of a hit, right? So now you might be on, you might be on a four, five, or six, but they're in a bunker or they're in a foxhole or whatever the case might be. So it might drop down to a four or in trees and a, and a bunker or trees and a, and a foxhole. That brings that down. So quite often you'll end up looking to get a one or a two for a hit. And a one or a two, awesome. I got a 20% chance of getting a hit. Uh, well, I guess if I count the zero, I've got a 30% chance, right? So if zero, one or two on a two to hit, it's not bad, 30% chance. But, but what tends to happen in this game, I find, which to me is kind of counterintuitive, is um, I'm encouraged to take crappy shots. Because you can never go below a zero. You can always take a zero rated shot. It could be a minus five, but it's gonna be treated as a zero. Now maybe it can start, maybe that's an exaggeration, but you get my point. So if I put a light barrage on someone who's in a pillbox, I am not going to get a result unless I roll a zero, a one chance in 10, 10% chance. Uh, but I will put that barrage marker on them and I might just get lucky and, and they may have to do a route check and they might fail. And we'll get to route checks and troop quality and stuff like that in a minute because that's another factor in the, in the conflict uh, and CRT stuff. So the CRT has got this interesting dichotomy where high firepower is good and gets you really nasty deadly results. But most often, it's going to, the, the, the result you're seeking to resolve is going to be way down in the, in the lower end, a zero, one, or two. So even if, you're got, if you've got a crappy shot, you may as well take it. You may as well just grab the die and roll. And most times, I'll just throw, I'll get uh, a couple of dice, if they're all going to be zeros, and I'll just go, hey, the black one's this, the white one's this, and the red one's that. You throw them in there. If there's a zero, let's have a look. If there's not, let's just move on. And so it's kind of like, yeah, I'm just gonna throw some ammo down range, <clears throat> hope for the best, we'll see what happens. It doesn't feel to me like that's a, a sound tactic. <laughs> hey, just give me some more mortar shells, let's put them down on there, man, let's see what happens. Now I know there's a benefit from uh, restricting the, the capabilities of the units in the hex and we're suppressing their firepower. That's great for, for the indirect fire stuff. But for small arms fire and even for tank fire, you're like, well, we might as well shoot, right? Because there's no supply in this game. So um, why not, right? So I do have a problem with that still. And that's me in my head. I wouldn't say that's a game feature that's broken or bad. I just, it just sticks in my crawl. So, uh, we, so that kind of leads me to true quality. Another way that you can uh, reflect the fatigue of a particular unit or, or formation is by giving them shitty uh, TQ ratings. Or giving the uh, enemy who's well rested and well fed and uh, uh, well supplied, give them higher troop quality ratings and so they can, you know, soldier on and laugh at all the artillery that's being uh, flung at them. You know, you shoot at something 10 times and get no result, and then you throw in one crappy uh, shot and uh, you get a zero and you get a suppression and then you roll again and you get another zero and now you've killed the unit with the two most l two most least likely shots which i did in this game i fired at this one hex 10 15 times here's here's a handful of dice let's 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 find a zero. Oh, okay didn't get any then you do two crappy shots just because because you know one of the guys Pete said oh well, you might as well fire your mortars at me and see what happens I went ah oh, okay boom two zeros done thanks for playing so that guy was dead gone pillbox is gone breakthrough happens <laughs> what <laughs> it's just kind of really weird anyway uh, the TQs though if you don't get that suppression result you might get a, a, a result that says hey uh, you got to roll for uh, true quality you do that you fail makes you pinned and gets you penalties, no movement, reduced firepower or no firepower as the case may be. And you've got to spend command points to remove those. So now, uh, as I'm pinning you, here's a very nice mechanic that rather than me, now I have to make a choice as the opposing player when my formation chip comes out, I've got to make a choice. Do I want to uh, fix my pinned guys who might become suppressed or fix my suppressions and make them pins? Or do I want to spend those points on other things 
to be more combative with you, more kinetic and, and shoot back at you and things like that. So now, because I'm getting those pins and suppressions on you, I'm pulling away your ability to make choices about how you fight with me. So that's another interesting set of uh, dynamics that go into the game that make it very, very interesting to play. And it's another level of uh, onion uh, in the, another layer of the onion that uh, you don't appreciate until you get some turns in, right? Um, Let's see, so I said no supply really that matters at all. Uh, un unlimited mortar ammo, unlimited artillery ammo, unlimited small arms ammo for the two, three, four days, that your two, three days you may be playing this particular battle. I'm not sure I'm happy with that necessarily. Can't tell you about the historical narrative really because I don't know too much about the battle, but I can say that this uh, felt like World War I for the first four turns and then it sort of broke open a little bit it's all mostly foot here. There's very few uh, squadrons or companies of tanks. Uh, so I would probably say that uh, it felt like a World War I trench battle on this one particular map. And I think the other map is a little more dynamic. So once you get past that though, once you break through two, three, four hexes, it's gonna get ugly for the, for the Germans because they're gonna have to start pushing stuff up into unprepared positions hopefully build a foxhole before they get uh, shot at by the bad guys. Uh, you might see uh, the, the Russians rush in and, <laughs> Russians rush in, the Russians move in quickly and start uh, plinking away at you before you're in foxholes. And that's when the momentum can change in the game and it become, become a little bit more open. But do not advance through the open and allow yourself to get plinked at with the heavy artillery that's gonna come pounding down on you as you try to advance and move into position to uh, take advantage of uh, uh, this, this breakthrough. Very deadly, I lost almost, uh, uh, well, I lost two companies and a couple of support units because we had one unit that I forgot to pop into foxholes so I didn't have enough direct command points, command points to uh, put them in a foxhole temporarily so they would have a little bit of uh, protection. So he took advantage of that and uh, nailed the, nailed my guys pretty hard, killed, killed the, the whole lot. Um, general narrative. <clears throat> There's a lot going on in this game and there are a lot of pieces. And uh, there is some narrative here. I, I was trying to write some things down as we played, trying to get, get an understanding of how, how the story was evolving. But it gets very chaotic and uh, and it's very difficult to have a plan for here, right? You send one company up to let them get chewed up and then basically you're gonna move the next next company in or you're gonna move the next platoon in or the next battalion in, depending on uh, how badly things are going and how well you use your, your tools. So the narrative comes out, I think you can, you can imagine uh, the artillery being uh, pounding down here and uh, messing with the Germans, the Germans replying uh, in, in anger. There's some air factors going into the game as well. So that, that came out pretty nicely. It, the game play time, so I think the narrative's okay. Right? I wouldn't say it's bad at all. Uh, the the playtime here is on the one map version between the three of us, I would have to say it's probably an hour a turn or 45 minutes would, uh, for a turn. Uh, we started at 10 a.m., probably didn't get started until 10.30. Took a quick 15, 20 minute break for some, uh, some lunch and then finished up at four or 4.30. And I think we got, I wanna say we got six turns done. So with three divisions on the map. So it gives you a feel, a feel for it. I will say, well, here's, here's, the, here's one of the very cool things about this game. It's trying to be, it's trying to give you a, a, a depth and feel of what uh, happens at the company scale and battalions of, of un, uh, units moving around and all, its, all their elements. So it's wisely chosen to make those, those decisions about shooting and moving and DRMs and column shifts and things of that nature, very simple and very streamlined. So it can play quickly once you're comfortable with, with the rules. And I think that's the, one of the biggest benefits here. Unlike some other larger games that are at this similar scale where there is a lot of math involved with fractions of this and take 10% of that and 42% of that and swap a column and go up one and down one and add this and don't forget that guy over there and box a naked lady tease, right? While that gives you some technical detail, 
it, it's not enhancing the game play time. It's not enhancing the game experience necessarily for me in any case, nor for the two guys I was playing with. So we felt like this was very streamlined and very approachable and quite a bit of fun with some oddities and anomalies. And I think some of that will go back to the designer and I'll put that back on Adam and say, you know, get some help or some support with your scenario design because there's just some things that are have been off in the last two or three modules of this these games whether it's css or gs gts that i played you just you just like why, why why am i doing this for 10 turns why why didn't we start here or, or why didn't we stop there or why is this an objective right i just like we could see for instance with this it would have been very interesting as uh, as the russian player to come up the peninsula and then choose my own approach and have this be more of a uh, maybe this was a meeting engagement i don't know whether were the germans set in place with pillboxes and all the rest of it for months or weeks but let's say the pillboxes were in place but all the other uh, uh, dug in positions and uh, trenches and things of that nature were not wouldn't that be an interesting experience to see if the Germans could get into position, get dug in, choose their ground they want to defend on, while the Soviets chose their approach? Maybe I would have been better off with the, with the Red Russians on the right flank and the less effective, slower, but with lots of arty uh, Russians on the left flank and, uh, and trying to bang their way into this factory area and the, along the coastline. That would have been maybe cool to have a choice as a game player, a game player of that part of the history. Maybe that could have been an option. So I think there's probably some further development that could happen in some of these games. It's not a big criticism. The, the, most of the time they're fine and they're following the historical, I think they're following the historical vein pretty closely. So anyway. Um, and I think that probably covers its components. Yeah, let's, so let's talk about components for a few minutes, just two minutes. Some of the color choices are just, I, it's kind of like, I don't know whether uh, whether it's Compass or the artist or Adam, you know, it's not cute. It, it's really just not cute. I, I, I don't understand why you would choose some of the colors you chose, or whether it's just a, hey, you know, I'm gonna do these guys in light pink with this color font for that and this color font for that. Uh, Information counters with brown on brown, uh, right, uh, writing, impossible to read unless you, you gotta get up, stand up, lean over, look at the counter on the right angle on the right to read it, really freaking annoying. So just bad choices from a, from a user interface experience. So I will say that was really crappy, right? Uh, I'm not a big fan of gen in general of the uh, color choices for some of the Russian forces. Uh, even even the brand, this brown uh, that was used for the division if you don't have the right contrasting colors there, it's really hard to read. Uh, if, and I have no color blindness issues. God forbid if you had color blindness with this. Fantastic maps. It's just beautiful artwork on the maps. Good rule books, good charts. A very consumable rule book relative to, to prior uh, uh, editions. I think the, the CSS system is now finally matured enough that you can probably afford to invest in a very expensive game for what you get in the box. I'm just gonna say that. And Compass is, and I think everyone knows that Compass is a little more expensive than others. They don't do P500s and all the rest of it. They just, they make them and they ship them. And I don't know how many they make. I don't know how many they ship, but they, they're trying to do their best with their price structure that they have. But I find them to be extremely expensive games. And I'm always wary of making a choice on them because sometimes they're not as well developed as they should be. This game, this game system is now much better developed. And I think uh, if the time was spent to go back and fix some of the problems in some of the Pacific games and make those rules available to uh, folks online in a, in a more consumable manner uh, and keep the, the system separate. Uh, so there's Pacific systems and there's um, the you know Eastern Front or, or European systems as the case may be. A couple of goofy uh, rules that, that you know, these wave attacks there's nothing special about a wave attack. It's just an assault and it costs twice as much. So that's not a unique feature. Uh, that's touted on the box or in the artwork some, or in the, in the summary somewhere. That's the only unique feature I could see in terms of uh, 
the combat capabilities that I'm aware of anyway. Keep in mind we didn't play the other the other half of the map. The good news is the landings are the landings. You don't have to go through this uh, arduous uh, sort of uh, Normandy style landing with 54 different uh, things that have to be resolved before you put a unit on the map. So that was very, very nice. All right, this has probably been too long uh, by far, uh, by 15 minutes. So I wanted to give you, but I wanted to give you some more feel for this. I'm really leaning into this system a little bit more. We'll see how they handle the modern stuff, the full the gap game that's coming out, uh, how they hand, handle extreme range and air and EW and all this other chemical weapons and all this other stuff. So that'll be interesting to see. I'm not pre-ordering that one, unfortunately. My my buddy is, and we'll play his copy, and then if it's good, we'll we'll get we'll get a copy uh, uh, later on. So the uh, the CSS system from Compass Games. It was a very enjoyable time. Thanks.